Well, now, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and for those so nice words of introduction. Uh, introducing a speaker is a literary genre in itself. Uh, the motto of which could be the following one, don't pull your punches, I can take any compliment. <laughs> and thank you, by the way, for the great honor that is bestowed upon me with this uh, medal. I'm not sure I deserve it, but anyway, you must know better. <laughs> well, that's a way for me to confess what is, as a matter of fact, absolutely obvious. I'm in no way an Aquinas scholar. So that I will have to belabor what for many people here and elsewhere is the obvious. I'm sure that tons of coal will be brought to Newcastle this evening. On the other hand, on the other hand <clears throat> I may have the advantage, which is the flip side of naivete, i.e. a fresh look at things combined with some genuine enthusiasm. In particular, for Aquinas' doctrine, on providence, which is to be found in various places in his works, the best account being probably the third part of the second Summa, the Contra Gentiles, in the chapters 111 and following. There is in Aquinas, that's my assumption, an, artic an articulated doctrine of providence, and I will try to sketch it to show its coherence, and as my title promises, to bring to the fore its relevance for our times, that is, for our present predicament. This doctrine and providence is not, and does not claim to be, totally original. The same holds true, by the way, of Aquinas' whole thought, but claiming to be original and being really original and deep are worlds apart. As far as the influences uh, upon uh, Aquinas' work, well, he draws heavily upon previous thinkers, be they Christian, Jewish, or pagan. Among the Christians, Augustine has pride of place. Among the pre-Christian pagans, Aristotle and the Stoics. Among the Jews, the influence of Rabbi Moses, i.e. Moses Maimonides, can hardly be denied. And among the post-Christian pagans, i.e. the Muslims, Aquinas took advantage of Avicenna's works, in particular the metaphysics, and of Averroes' commentaries on Aristotle, which did not compel him to uh, make a scathing critique of some of their views. In any case, Aquinas' doctrine on providence brings already existing ideas into a systematic form that gives each of its, fe of its features a greater power and often a new meaning. You know this beautiful image that he uses in his commentary on Boetius de Trinitate. Uh, when Christians take up pagan ideas, they are not mingling water with wine, they are changing water into wine. And this is what he did. Well, I'll have to sketch uh, his doctrine of providence in several steps. For the most part, they will be illustrated by quotes from the works uh, of Thomas Aquinas. There are 13 of such steps, so you'll be able to know precisely where we are and how long I'll bore the pants of you. As for the relevance of uh, Aquinas' doctrine of providence, this is the promise of my title, well, I will have to point out from time to time what kind of difficulty or objection they could help us to meet. First, I will present this in the form of thesis, you know, short, pithy formulas that are supposed to capture a whole set of ideas. First, God creates beings that possess a nature, i.e. a stable program of action. We are told the idea of nature is Greek, 
not Christian, and in any case, not biblical. Well, if we mean explicitly present in the form of a word, this is very true. The Hebrew word for nature does not appear earlier as the Mishnah in the second century of Christian era. Yet the idea of nature may be implicitly present in the Bible, not as concepts, but in several stories. This is the case in the first account of cre the creation. Plants, we are said there, we are told there, plants bring forth their seed according to their species. Trees bring forth their fruit that contains their seed according to their species. And this idea of the species, uh, which makes that, uh, well, uh, uh, palm trees uh, don't produce, uh, well, uh, bananas or whatnot, is a first foretaste of the idea of nature. And the last day, the Shabbos, is another way to underline that God doesn't barge into the created world, but leaves the natures alone. He, le he leaves them produce their effect. It is not only the case that on the seventh day, God rests. There's a deeper phenomenon. He leaves his creatures in rest. He leaves them in peace. Which means that uh, the idea of things having a nature is not a betrayal of the biblical message, but on the contrary, it's uh, well, flowering in the form of philosophical concepts. According to this view of things, things are not bundle of qualities loosely connected first by God's whim, later on by God's habit, so that they were like puppets manipulated by a divine mountebank who pulls the strings. Aquinas takes up <clears throat> Maimonides' critique of the Asharite Kalam, the, the school of uh, the mainstream school of uh, uh, Islamic apologetics that developed such a view of things, i.e. things depend directly uh, on God. They are sort of hung on God by fine threads and God has to pull the strings. For Aquinas, such people abuse God by believing that he is not able to create independent and even free beings. He has in this context a splendid formula. To quote, to detract from the perfection of creatures is to detract from the perfection of divine power. Well, this is a teaching for us. Thinking too little of the creatures doesn't redound to God's glory. On the contrary, and it is important for us to keep this in mind because we often are tempted by a false piety to conceive of the relationship of God to his creatures as a balance of sorts, i.e. what God receives must be withdrawn from the creatures. In order to make room for God, we have to debase the created. Modern philosophers of the, 18th, of the 19th century, sorry, like Feuerbach or Nietzsche, took advantage of this error and used it as a weapon against Christianity. But, in fact, they were caught in the same booby trap. This is the case, for instance, the passage in which Nietzsche tells the parable of a mountain brook that flew towards the sea till one built a dam so that the level of its water rose. And in the same way, he contends that mankind will rise higher and higher if it stops losing itself into God. And we have here the perfect image of the stupid <laughs> view according to which what we give God must be taken away from, uh, from man. And, well, Thomas's assumption is that we have here a win-win relationship. 
Irenaeus of Lyon, a church father of the third century, has this wonderful formula, the glory of God is man alive. We may generalize. God's glory is the creation. Irenaeus mentions man because creation becomes conscious of itself in human beings only. And because man only needs salvation. I'll tell you more on this later. Okay, that's the general conception of creation in Aquinas. Second point. Beings have different modes of being that depends on their nature. Quote, each thing has its proper act of being in accord with the mode or measure of its nature. A commodious way to express that would consist in introducing a concept, the concept of subsistence. Let me make this clear. Created beings don't have the same way of subsisting. Subsisting is not exactly the same thing as being, for uh, being in the sense, in the meaning of to exist, to be there. Whatever is, exists. But what is does not subsist in the same way. Just to give you a simple example, the way in which color exists, or subsists rather, the way in which color subsists is not the same as the way in which a surface exists. For color, it subsists by spreading itself on a surface. And the surface subsists by limiting a volume, by being what we see uh, 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 of a three-dimensional uh, thing. And now, there is an, an, a particularly interesting case of this uh, difference, of these uh, different modes or different levels of subsistence. This is individuation. Things are individuals but they are not individuals in the same way. Minerals, a stone for instance, subsist as elements, and the stone that I have in my hands is only a part of a vein torn apart from it only accidentally. What really exists is the element. Plants subsist as species, the, individu <coughs> the individuals of which simply coexist without their interacting. When the individuals interact, they do that only on the level of sexuality. For there are male and female plants, as everybody knows, palm trees, for instance. Animals subsist as groups, the individuals of which may interact even on the level of a common action that redounds to the good of the individual as such and only indirectly to the welfare of the species. For instance, when they hunt in groups. And above that, they are governed by instinct. And instinct ensures the survival of the species. So they are not totally individualized. Their being individuals is an abstract fact. What really is the case is rather either the element or the species, the element for minerals and the species for living beings. With man, a step further is waged in the direction of individuation, for human beings subsist as persons who can freely interact, build families and cities. We are not born <coughs> to a species. We are born to parents. We are persons born to persons. And this is important because we will have to look at the way in which providence influences persons 
as such and not only as members of this or that species. Three, since those natures are not on the same footing, providence varies according to the level of being on which it takes place. Providence is not the same for plants, for animals, for human beings, and so on. We have here a basic formula by Thomas, quote, God takes care of each nature according to what it can receive. What it can receive is the way in which I translate the word capacitas. This basic formula resembles a great deal the catchword of perfect socialism, such as it was first formulated by the French Louis Blanc and later made famous by Karl Marx, to each according to his need. Hmm? Well, I'll skip a short passage on Plotinus that is mere, well, no, it wouldn't make sense here. <laughs> but I won't skip the occasion to observe that we are facing here a very medieval problem, i.e., does God know the individual members of a species or only the species as such? As you know, they had to cope with uh, Aristotle's God, who, according to the, to the easier way um, for us to interpret him, does not even know what is below him. Not the creatures, because he's not a creator. The world is eternal. And well, some people said, he certainly doesn't know you and me, but he has ideas. He has the ideas of whatever will exist, of whatever exists. The future tense is too many here. And for this reason, he knows the species, but not the individuals. And now, uh, the answer of Thomas is that God looks after what subsists as a species by looking after the species as such. For instance, he enables, well, the cattle or whatnot, even wild animals, to go on existing as species. Because they subsist as species, the individuals are only abstractions. In the case of human beings who subsist as persons, well, he looks after them as persons because they are persons as such. And for this reason, God does not neglect this or that animal, say a pussycat or what not, because there is no such a thing as this or that animal. This or that animal exist, exists only by abstraction, or because we persons bestow on her, in the case of a cat, bestow on her some equivalent of a personal identity by uh, giving her a name, for instance. But this is what we do, not what things are. For this explains why God does not leave any creature in the lurch without his being compelled to care for them directly. And now, this was already seen by St. Augustine. Let me quote some lines and by Augustine. That's in the De Agone Cristiano. God ex exercises a direct providence over holy, rational creatures, okay, either the angels or our humble selves, but rules everything else by means of these. Accordingly, it was possible for the apostle to say in all truth, for God has no care for oxen. Well, 
this is shocking. All lovers of animals will be shocked. <laughs> and for good reasons. As if God neglected animals and paid attention to the human species only. This is well, this gives evidence of a human pride, of a ridiculous pride. And you know that contemporary authors in this country coined the word speciesism, an analogy to racism and to the bevy of new words that are rampant among liberal intellectuals, machism, sexism, lookism, and so on. <laughs> Let's go on reading Augustine. God teaches men in the sacred scriptures how to deal with their fellow men and how they are to serve God himself. But men themselves know how to handle their sheep. That is, they know how to provide for their well-being from experience, practical skill, and native intelligence, all of which they have received, of course, from the creator's bountiful resources. Well, this means that God does not simply forget all about uh, the herds of cattle and the flock of sheep. Well, he has entrusted them to lower beings than himself, i.e. to, well, human beings. God entrusts to superior beings the care of inferior ones. And there is, for this reason, some room for the Platonic doctrine of intellect, which Aquinas reinterprets as the angels. Five, providence gives each and every created being what it needs for it to reach its own good and to do that by itself. This runs counter to the common view on providence according to which God takes the task from the hands of creatures and fixes everything up while their back is turned in the same way as what we tell our kids, you know, some nice imps stay awake in the night and while peasants are asleep and do the work of peasants. God is no parachute. He gives us whatever we need in order to fix it by ourselves. Says Aquinas right at the beginning of his wonderful treatise on laws, God gives the instruments, but he doesn't do the work himself because we can do that properly. Well, I use the word socialism, but here it would not be exaggerated to use the word liberalism in the best sense of the term, for there is a best sense. No? <laughs> Aquinas explains social organization in a way that has something to do with political liberalism. Just have a look at what he says about division of labor. Division of labor is said to stem from a liking that is in each individual the result of divine providence. Quote, this division of various tasks among different persons is done by divine providence inasmuch as some people are more inclined to one kind of work than to another. There are people who like to uh, uh, look after other people's teeth. There are people who like to fix your sink. Okay, and well, they were not, properly speaking, made dentists or plumbers by God, but they were given the uh, taste, you know, the, the kick of doing that. The cosmopolis is not ruled in the same way as the Platonic Callipolis. There is not the ghost of any totalitarianism in God's rule. Six. The good is not the same for lower and higher beings. What is the good for, say, 
elementary particles, atoms if you prefer. Well, the good consists in being what one is, full stop. For the elements, for the elements. And we, we are here in a cosmology that is no longer our modern cosmology, but the cosmology according to which the elements strive to reach their proper place. Heavy things okay, fall, light things like fire okay, uh, go upwards towards the heavens. The good of the elements consists in getting to one's proper place. The good of plants consists in growing. The good of animals consists in happiness. And the good of human beings as such, not only as living beings, but as rational and free beings, is salvation and moral holiness. Holiness, sorry. <coughs> now, according to this view, the good is less and less simply received. It is more and more something that we do. There is a German novelist, Erich Kestner, uh, that's the author of the immensely successful novel for children, Emil and the Detectives. And well, he wrote a short poem that everybody <laughs> knows by rote in Germany. Uh, let me translate the line. There is no such thing as a good thing unless one does it. This is true up to a point. For above the good that we do, there must be some good that makes us. I'll, have, I'll be given the opportunity tomorrow to expatiate on that. I could certainly find a unity of sorts or a focal meaning as a a British uh, classical scholar and philosopher said in order to translate uh, uh, Aristotle's pros hen, you know, some sort of, well, okay, this would lead us too, too far. One could find some unity between the good of the atom, the good of the element, the good of the plant, good enough, and so on, by saying, well, the good is the conservation of one's own being getting on being what one is. Now, this good as conservation is the good for everything, but this being in which we remain, in which things remain, in which they stay what they are, is not always the same. And conservation is not universal. We have here to qualify the modern reduction of desire to desire of self-conservation. This is a basic idea of modern thought, and we have here to qualify it in the light of Aquinas. For the following reason, which is, by the way, my seventh point. Sacrificing one's lower good on behalf of a higher good is a rule that already obtains in the natural realm. Let me take an everyday example, a plant, say a tree. A tree is made of earth and water. The natural desire of both elements, or if we want to avoid the word desire, which may sound rather anthropomorphic, let's say what they do when they are left alone. What they do is to lie as low as possible or to flow as low as possible. Ideally, uh, they would be at the center of the earth. But now, in the plants, in the tree, earth and water are driven upwards and, so to speak, unwillingly. If they could vote, <laughs> they certainly would vote nay. We want to uh, remain where we are. We want to lie uh, on, uh, on the floor uh, uh, on the earth. 
we have not uh, the ghost of, an, uh, of a desire to climb upwards. And this is what the plant does. This is what life has uh, the elements uh, do. Sacrifice in this case, we, can, we may speak of sacrifice, is not only a question of quantity. For there is a quantitative view of sacrifice. This is Caiaphas's view. It is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This is very true. And the same model is still defended by biologists who stand for the theory of genes. We remember uh, J.B.S. Haldane. Uh, J.B.S. Haldane was a Scottish biologist, and he has a tongue-in-the-cheek calculus. He should risk his life by well, plunging uh, into the current in order to rescue two brothers or eight cousins, <laughs> according to the rules of genetics. In this case, in the present case, the relationship does not obtain between the whole and one of its parts, but between two ways of looking at the same whole. For the whole plant is made of earth and of water, but life gr grasps each and every part of it and pushes them forward, upwards. In the animal, the whole animal wants to feed and thrive. Its natural desire is to lead some sort of happy life. In man, well, this desire is submitted to the demands of moral law that can curb our desire for happiness. Kant, the German philosopher Kant, has very interesting things to tell us on this point. Moral life according to him, does not consist in the pursuit of happiness. I'm sorry for Locke and for his American followers. I'm sorry for the authors of self-help books who promise us happiness without tears, or words to that effect. No. Moral life consists in our striving to make ourselves worthy to be happy. Whether we'll be happy or not depends on external circumstances. But what we have to do is to, well, as Kant tells us, and his formula is fantastic, make us worthy to be happy. Eight. The higher the rung on which a creature stands on the ladder of beings, the more its action is entrusted to itself, the more complicated the strategy it will have to enact, and the freer it is to launch into the actions that will enable it to reach its own good. The action is simple in the case of plants, simplest in the case of elements and minerals. It's a bit more tricky in the case of animals who have to uh, uh, use a great deal of uh, cunning and things like that in order to reach their good. And in man, well, it involves an extremely complicated set of ploys of the, well, let's say a whole strategy. I fall back into the uh, same word. But in order that action might be entrusted to anything whatsoever, this thing must possess some inner principle of action, must be able to do things. And for this reason, things must be somehow free. For freedom exists in an inchoative stage in each creature, but it is hidden in the lower levels 
and comes to the fore more and more distinctly as one goes upwards. Freedom begins with a simple coincidence with oneself. Being left alone, being allowed to be what one is, is a first level of freedom, a very humble one. But that's already a foretaste of what freedom will become in the case of conscious beings like human beings. Bodies freely regain their natural place. We say they fall freely. It's something like a free fall. Plants develop and stretch their bows. Animals move and look for what they have to desire in order to subsist as individuals, i.e. food and shelter, and in order to subsist as species, i.e. they look for sexual partners. Men have to choose between contraries, this or that. Angels, you know that Aquinas is called Doctor Angelicus, which doesn't mean he was specially nice, but it means he had written a great deal about angels. He had a whole new theory of angels. And the angels, according to the classical theory, choose in an instant what they are. Nine. The freedom of the creature interacts with God's action according to the kind of creature God has to deal with. Quote, God sets everything in motion according to the way. Therefore, God's incentive is participated by some with necessity, animals, plants, and so on, but with liberty by rational nature, since rational power is related to contraries. Well, he's alluding here with his idea of a rational power. Uh, he's alluding to uh, a theory by Aristotle, uh, i.e., um, there are two kinds of uh, capacities, uh, capacities that can, uh, that was some, some sort, uh, uh, one tracked, uh, i.e., fire. Fire can burn, but can't, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, can't cool things. Uh, uh, capacities that are rational, capacities that can choose, can do something, and the contrary. You know, the physician can cure you, but kill you too, if, uh, well, he wants. Hmm? And for this reason, providence lets beings act from the inside and don't foist on them uh, a, uh, an action that would be unavoidable for them to, uh, to, 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 to do. Hmm? God is the universal source of motion, but each being is moving according to the nature that it received from him. You, you see the importance of my first point. You know, A great deal of things depend on this concept of things having a nature and acting according to this nature. Simple examples. We carry a bag. We lead a horse by the bridle. We give orders to a child. We endeavor to convince an adult by strong arguments. We lead them, we set them in motion, but certainly not in the same way. Tenth point, in the case of man, as a rational creature, a step further is made. And it's highly interesting to observe that Aquinas doesn't conceive the superiority of man over other beings as consisting in a greater freedom vis-a-vis -vis providence. He never plays freedom against providence but the other way about. He tries to think both together. The superiority of man consists in being submitted to providence in another way. 
far from consisting in a greater distance vis-à-vis -vis providence, this superiority consists in a closer appropriation. We make providence our own. Quote, among all others, the rational creature is subject to divine providence, is subject to divine providence, in the most excellent way, insofar as it partakes of a share of providence by being provident both for, him, for itself and for others. And elsewhere, Aquinas relates the superiority to a greater proximity to God, which he expresses through the biblical metaphor of man created in God's likeness. Quote, Among all things, spiritual substances, and we are that way, spiritual substances stand closest to the first principle, i.e. God. This is why they are said to be stamped with God's image. That's a literal quotation of Genesis. Consequently, by God's providence, they are not only provided for, but they are provident themselves. And therefore, according to a wonderful play on words that is, by the way, real, and that's the real etymology of the word. That's a, an old pun that is found in Cicero too. Providentia, providence, becomes in man prudentia, i.e. prudence, and not only prudence uh, in the flat meaning of watching one's steps, but prudence as being able to plan one's action and to uh, choose, uh, choose the goal, to choose the target, and to choose the means that will lead to it uh, in, the mo in the easiest and most efficient way, and in the morally best way as well. My eleventh uh, point uh, deals with religious matters. In religious matters, God does not interfere wherever this is not strictly necessary. Not interfering in what other people can do properly is the so-called principle of subsidiarity. This principle of subsidiarity is Christian and even Catholic in origin, for it was first formulated by Pope Pius XI as an answer to the claim of Italian fascism, i.e. the totalitarian state, everything by the state and everything for the state, said one of the uh, uh, major thinkers of Italian fascism, a philosopher by the name of the name of Giovanni Gentile. This origin of the principle of subsidiarity is known to legal scholars, and it is good that they should acknowledge it. Yet its roots are to be looked for, to be looked for in the very core of the Christian idea of God, not only in uh, the uh, uh, social doctrine of the church. God need not tell us what we have to do. We don't possess, to be sure, a clear innate knowledge of what is right and wrong. Far from that, and especially when it comes to particular cases, to what is commonly known as casuistic. But we do possess the instruments that could enable us, if we wield them properly, to deal with the problems that we have to cope with. And we possess them because God has put them in our nature as rational and free beings. We have a moral feeling or conscience. We have the experience of history. We have hoarded up the wisdom of previous generations. God has not to add anything new. 
to this toolbox. And as a consequence, Aquinas can say in his treatise on laws that the Ten Commandments are hardly more than reminders of something that we, in principle at least, should be able to know by ourselves. Twelve. God has not to intervene in any case, but there is a case in which he has to intervene. He has to enter history through covenants in the old covenant, precisely, and through incarnation in the new covenant. He has to enter history because he has to encounter man where he or she is, i.e., in historical life. Man leads a historical life, hence God has to meet him in history. He had to operate man's salvation by entering human life so that he can meet, say, Adam, where he is. For God's problem with man, and man's problem, is not how to teach him or her what is to be done, for he already gave mankind the necessary outfit by endowing mankind with reason and freedom. No, the real problem is how a free being is to be motivated towards choosing its own good. Incarnation does not presuppose any privilege of the human species over against other beings. Man's privileges are the consequence of a worse initial situation. There is no such thing as a Christian anthropocentrism contrary to an ever-recurrent objection. Well, you do everything. You think that God has done everything for man? Well, uh, he doesn't pay attention to other beings. Well, if there is something like an anthropocentrism, like putting man at the center of everything, this does not redound exactly to the glory of man. First, because the center is not always a place of honor. In medieval villages, what was in the middle of the public square? The pillory. Let me tell you a parable of sorts. Well, the scene takes place in a hospital ward. A patient is telling the, another patient in the next bed, wow, other people like you, for instance, you, you've got only five grains of aspirin or nothing at all. But for me, Many doctors came and visited and examined me. They gave me dozens of colorful and very expensive pills. <laughs> One gave me a receipt of 613 medications. I am not looked upon by run-of-the-mill nurses and quickly glanced at by medical students and even the chief physician in person came down from his corner office, spent a great deal of time with me and examined me long and carefully. No doubt I must be a big screaming deal. <laughs> Says the other patient, you are only a twit. You are more seriously ill than the other people, full stop. If God must set in, if God must set in stage a whole strategy in order to ensure man's salvation, the reason is man's desperate state of health. <laughs> Thirteenth point, God is sort of adjustable. We've seen that providence well, changes according to the level of the being with which uh, it or she has to do. And God is sort of adjustable. Well, it depends on what kind of thing we need in order 
to get an ultimate foundation for moral life and for the so-called values. You need not have the Trinitarian God, a pagan God, a philosophical God, like the God of the Stoics or the God of the 18th century philosophers. Such a God fills the bill well enough. In order to have a civil religion, you may have just any God. And this is, by the way, Eisenhower's well-known formula. There must be a God. What kind of God? Okay, it's not, not uh, important. Yeah? On the other hand, you need a God who creates out of mere generosity if you want to legitimate the very existence of mankind on this earth. This is an endeavor for which you absolutely need an external fulcrum in order to put uh, Archimedes' lever uh, at the right place. And finally, you need a God of personal love if you want to make some sense of extra moral concepts like grace or forgiveness. There can't be any philosophical theory of grace and or forgiveness. You can have more taste of it, but not a full-fledged theory. Well, this adjustability of God holds true first for the very idea of revelation. There is a question that is more often than not asked by people who are not as lucky as to believe. How is it that God is not easily, evidently present in his creation? Well, we know St. Paul at the beginning of the epistle to the Romans says that we should be able to elicit some knowledge of God, of his power and wisdom from the, well, the marvels of the created world. This is very true, but this presupposes an effort. There is no such thing as an inscription on each and every creature made in God. Why is this the case? Well, a great deal of answers were given by different thinkers. My own answer, and I hope it is, well, perhaps not Thomistic, but not totally unfaithful to uh, Thomas's view of providence. My answer is that God's first aim is not to be known but to do his creatures good turns. And if this can happen unless he gives away what kind of fellow he is, then he does that. And he obviously puts the created world at our disposal. And at its own disposal, for the world was not created only for, for us. It was created first and foremost for itself, out of the sheer goodness of God. God manifests himself only insofar as this manifestation can be helpful to his creatures. God is no ham actor playing to the gallery, let alone an exhibitionist. Revelation, but revelation is exhibition. Revelation occurs only when it is necessary. For God's aim is to bring his creation to its fulfillment, not to organize a clack. <laughs> and again we come to uh, Irenaeus's sentence, God's glory is the life of his creatures. Let me tell you another parable, or rather let me draw a comparison between the way in which God acts and the way in which a well-educated person acts in everyday life. When we are asked by somebody whom we don't know from Adam in the street, yeah, 
but could you please direct me to, to the post office? And we answer, if we know, of course, we say, well, okay, the straight ahead. Then you make a left, and that's the second, and you're right. And nobody would think of asking, and by the way, my name is Rémi Brad. He wouldn't do that. It would be bad manners. Bad manners. <laughs> we identify ourselves, on the other hand. We may even write down our name and address or hand over a business card when and only when we hope that we can help further. God acts exactly in the same way. He wants the good of his creature, and when the good of his creature implies that he makes himself known, that he makes himself explicit, he does that. This is what we call revelation. That's not necessary uh, at the elementary level of creation. We have an analogous idea in an implicit way in Aquinas' concise but very interesting critique of Islam, which is for me interesting. You know, I used to uh, teach Arabic philosophy. I'm no Islamologist, but I had to uh, pay attention to what Islam is about. And well, he says that, that the contra gentiles, it's not in a theory of providence, but he says, well, uh, um, something that is commonly translated by the received translation of Anton Pegis, as for proofs of the truth of his doctrine, Muhammad brought forward only such as could be grasped by the natural ability of anyone with a very modest wisdom. And well, this is very much in keeping with the usual meaning of the Latin word documentum, you know, proofs of the truth. But we can scarcely understand the logics of the argument. How could it be that bringing proofs for the vulgar, bringing proofs that are easy to understand, how could this be a drawback of the doctrine? On the contrary, this would be an advantage. And for this reason, I interpret the passage in another way. I understand the word documentum as meaning teachings, doctrines from docere. And I would take the word truth very seriously in the way that the immediate context suggests what Muhammad teaches, according to Aquinas, is true. There is only one God. This God is just and merciful and so on. This is very true. But we need no prophet for us to know that. Aristotle, Aristotle told us already there is only one God and he even demonstrated there is only one. Plato said that God must be just and merciful and should not play hide and seek with us like Zeus, uh, taking different forms in order to uh, seduce this or that girl. And it's in the Republic, book two. Eh? Islam puts forward a revelation to teach things about God and to issue regulations that could have been known by unaided natural reason. We need no revelation for us to know that there is only one God and that, uh, say, uh, organizing a genocide is hardly cricket. <laughs> According to uh, Aquinas' critique, Islamic revelation is not false, but it is superfluous, it is useless. Yeah. On the other hand, in order to uh, get to ensure man's salvation, and the salvation of a being who, according to Christian dogmatics, has chosen against God, has chosen to pretend to be independent from God, God must contrive a complicated strategy. This is the strategy 
that we commonly call by the name of economy of salvation or history of salvation in a loser way of speaking. This strategy could not have been contrived by a human mind. For us who live after that, we are in front of this strategy uh, in the same uh, attitude as before a great painting or a great work of music. I, a, you, we couldn't possibly have guessed in advance how the painting had to look like, how the, mu the, the piece of music of a symphony had to sound like. But now, now it is there, it looks or sounds evident. Well, as a conclusion, Aquinas' doctrine of providence mirrors the saint's gift for putting things at their place and for articulating them into a coherent whole in which things make sense where they belong. Putting them at the wrong place produces confusion. And I've tried to point out some uh, possible and real, unfortunately, confusions. Thomas's doctrine enables us to avoid several pitfalls into which religious and philosophical thinkers of all ilk, as well as common people, were or are still lured. May it help us too. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a, a, a question. Thank you for your talk. Um, point number five was that providence gives each and every being what it needs to reach its end and to do so by itself, mm -hmm. if I'm stating that correctly. And later on you said man has the necessary powers. Uh, the incarnation deals with how to motivate man to choose his own good. How mm -hmm. do you reconcile these uh, statements mm -hmm with uh, Aquinas's and Augustine's uh, insistence that man needs grace mm -hmm. to do any good, man needs grace even to avoid sin mm -hmm. at all, right? Uh, and that man needs grace in our fallen state even to know what we could know by reason alone. Mm -hmm. So could you show, discuss a little bit how grace fits into this, what seems like or what could seem like to some people, a rather either Pelagian or Neo-Pelagian picture mm -hmm. that you've drawn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. This is a temptation that I try to avoid by all means, but I may have uh, <laughs> yielded to it. You know? Well, what I was trying to show is first that uh, God has to meet us where we are in the same way as he has generally meaning to meet each and every creature where this creature is. It so happens, or it so happened, that we sort of fell away from the place in which God had created us. This was possible because we had in our nature the uh, possibility and even the necessity of leading a historical life. Man is a being to which or to whom things can happen. Now, something really happened. I was well, clearly alluding to this at the end of my talk, and this is what we call the fall. Because we fell, God had to enter history in a certain way. And he had to confer on us as fallen beings what is necessary for us to recover what we should have been able to possess. And this is what we call grace. We, we are in absolute need of grace because we fell out of the state of original grace by making 
a uh, clumsy, to put it mildly, <coughs> use of our freedom. I never pretended, well, if my formulas can suggest something like Pelagianism, well, I, <laughs> okay, I discard them wholeheartedly. I may have expressed myself in a, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, well, clumsy, or not skillful enough way, but it's certainly not what I meant. No, grace is absolutely necessary because something happened. And we have to uh, be fixed, sort of. And what, what I'm interested in, you know, in the way in which uh, God had to uh, enable us by his grace uh, to uh, free our own freedom for what happened to us is uh, a uh, wound. We, we are crippled, sort of. Our freedom has become lame. Well, this is a common uh, experience, and this is the basic experience of Paul, for instance. You know, uh, what I like, I don't do. Uh, what I do, I don't like. You know? Augustine made very much the same experience when he discovered what the will is all about. And the will is a concept that hardly exists in ancient philosophy. And there are some foretastes um, when uh, Aristotle mentions the weakness of the will and things like that. But the real existential experience of the will arises from a consciousness of its weakness, and this is Augustine. The problem for Christianity is not, what shall I do? For this we know. And the trouble is even that we know what we should do. The problem is we don't do it. Okay. And well, the medication, what is commonly called grace, enables us precisely to do what we uh, could not do because we had lost the very strength, the very possibility of doing that, i.e. willing our own good. That's, that's awful. We know, <laughs> we know what, our, uh, what our good is, but we are, not, uh, we are no longer able really to want it. And for this reason, God's grace has to give us back uh, the freedom that we have lost. The, 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 the economy of salvation consists in giving back the freedom that we have, uh, let's say, injured or jeopardized. Mm -hmm. Just a little follow-up. Mm -hmm. You described uh, healing grace yep. nicely. What mm -hmm. about elevated grace or supernatural grace producing a supernatural effect? Well, uh, I try to uh, begin with the rock bottom realities you know we first have to be healed and what will come afterwards uh, well uh, if we are happy enough to experience it uh, we'll have we'll have two uh, I was not try I, I never tried you know to uh, enter into uh, what in my perhaps not humble enough opinion, are nice tears. You know, the, the, the most urgent task is salvation. What will come afterwards, okay, we'll see. Uh, sorry for the theologians who, uh, well, like those nice tears, but that's not uh, the most urgent thing that we have to do. We have to work our own salvation, or we have to receive it. Perhaps would be better formula, but we don't have to have to do that by our own strength. This this would be Pelagianism, and the elevating grace. Okay, we can pray for it in order to get it. Thank you very much, Dr. Brock. Uh, I was w hoping you could speak a little bit about the uh, the role of providence also in the political good. Because um, mm -hmm. if we're thinking about the perfection that we strive for as human persons, 
I also think, well, okay, we're also political by nature. Mm -hmm. And as such, um, sure, we strive for our perfection as individuals, but part of this striving is also going to involve, let's say, a participation in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the necessity of a political action, the necessity for us to build, well, what the ancients called cities, polis, has something to do with the very nature of man. We are political beings. And for this reason, uh, the full unfolding of our nature, and that's already in Aristotle, there's nothing, uh, nothing extraordinary about that, you know, that's even plain sailing. Yeah? Uh, we can't reach the fullness of our humanity except, well, <laughs> Uh, in uh, a uh, community that is, in the last analysis, uh, and in its more, in its full-fledged form, the city, the city as being able to reach the uh, self-sufficiency, uh, uh, the autarkeia, to speak with Aristotle. And well, what has all that to do with providence? Providence does not interfere directly uh, in the uh, choice of this or that political regime. Providence is there already at the most elementary level uh, of our nature. And our, the fact that we are political uh, beings is a consequence of our having created that way and created by this provident God. Now, the way in which we can enact this providence, uh, in which we can per make more perfect this political dimension of our beings by choosing well, the best possible political regime uh, at some point of time or in some place, in some climate. You know, uh, Aristotle uh, uh, says that uh, the best political regime in itself is not necessarily the best for this or that nation of this or that city. All this is entrusted to our freedom. And by the way, I uh, alluded to many uh, well, political dimensions of the idea of providence. I did that on purpose when I <laughs> called uh, to be sure with this, to be sure with this smile, uh, the general law, sort of, of providence's action uh, on the world as uh, being socialist uh, to some extent and as being liberal to some extent. It is both. It is both. Uh, the snag is that <laughs> if you try to elicit from, the, from God's ways uh, with uh, creatures a uh, political system, that consists in putting this or that person, this or that social group uh, in power, uh, then you'll get uh, the contrary of what you want. Thank you, Professor Brock. Um, my question is um, about a, a comment you made toward the beginning of your talk. You said that um, Nietzsche had been able to exploit a weakness mm -hmm. in the understanding of providence and freedom. Um, I was wondering, uh, the, so the, 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 the notion of nature and the notion of uh, created nature vis-a-vis -vis, um, providence mm -hmm. um, is not really in vogue, to say the least, right now. Um, how is it that um, you would recommend that we address Nietzsche's exploitation of that misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Well, I alluded to Nietzsche only en passant uh, as uh, well a, an example of a cast of mind that is unfortunately rampant uh, in our time and age, and you were alluding to i.e., uh, we can't easily understand 
that God could uh, work sort of for anybody else than for himself. We conceive of a God, or we conceive, we imagine a God who uh, looks for his own interest. <laughs> this is because we have lost, and well, I would be happy if uh, uh, we could recover uh, you, uh, we have lost the idea according to which uh, there may be uh, something like the good, like the Platonic idea of the good, i.e. Uh, of a principle of being that, uh, well, acts out of sheer generosity uh, as something that does not look for its own good and for the simple reason that this principle uh, is not something that has the good, but something that is the good. And well, in order to recover uh, a possible conception uh, of the good, we'll have, I'm afraid, to climb rather high and to, uh, uh, well, recover uh, a feeling for the necessity, for the uh, elementary necessity of the sorry for the word, metaphysics. <laughs> and without that, I'm afraid we'll uh, um, have to yield to a worldview according to which, well, everything is power, uh, uh, domination, things like that. We'll have uh, either Nietzsche, uh, well, purely uh, either the, the, the real uh, Tabasco or uh, we'll have a watered-down version of Nietzsche, Foucault and other people, unless we accept to uh, at least to consider the possibility of, an, of a metaphysics in which the identity of being and the good would be, uh, well, uh, at the center, I'm afraid we'll be unable to uh, get off the hook. But that's a tall order, I can admit that. I'm trying to work at these kind of things right now, but... Uh, <sighs> <laughs> uh, no, we really have to swim against the against uh, the, the stream. Eh? Um, okay, but if we don't do, who will? <laughs> as, Chesterton, as Chesterton said, uh, only living animals can uh, swim against the current. <laughs> Dead dogs follow the current. <laughs> May I um, ask... Um, Sometimes sure. in our colloquia, I ask the last question, and I think we might be getting there, so if I could ask the last question. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I loved uh, the way you introduced early on the notion of providence uh, with God um, uh, providing for creatures, uh, different creatures in different ways, depending upon their level of reality. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned speciesism which is a current um, mm -hmm. concept that uh, we should, uh, something we should avoid. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if uh, maybe you might consider um, the mistake that, uh, that we should avoid uh, in this regard uh, as maybe we could call it personism. That is to say, thinking of members, uh, things that are at the other levels like uh, the inanimate and the plants Mm -hmm. and the uh, animals as persons and trying to give them the same kind of notion of uh, individual attention by God uh, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. we think humans deserve. Mm -hmm. So I just, since you're a, a master of words, I thought, would you th what would you think about personism as something we should avoid? Well... <laughs> I have no quarrel 
I have no quarrel whatsoever, whatsoever against speciesism as far as species are concerned. You know, species are okay. Now it's the case that we do not, we human beings do not exist exclusively as members of a species. I tried to bring that out when I mentioned the fact that we were not born to a species, that we were born to parents, to people who have a face, people who have a name. And well, personism, uh, to distinguish from personalism that was uh, rather in vogue uh, uh, right after the war, uh, personism would be okay as well as far as we are dealing with persons. And well, animalism would be okay, mineralism would be okay. Uh, it depends, <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, uh, we should be uh, sort of pliable, you know. Uh, we Europeans have a huge advantage over uh, people who live on this side of the pond, you know. <laughs> we, have, we have cars with gears, with different gears. <laughs> and well, this is exactly what we should do uh, if we try to make sense of the concept of providence, you know. Everything depends on the kind of speed you want to reach and it, from the speed you want, uh, uh, with which you want to drive, you'll have to change gear. And well, um, I'm trying here to, to apply what I called, uh, well, with some tinge of irony, the principle of subsidiarity, and the generalization of the principle of subsidiarity. When we have to deal with beings of a certain level, we can be content with uh, uh, well, the necessary outfit without our uh, having to, uh, 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 to, to draw uh, the big artillery. Uh, it's enough for us to, uh, um, well, I, I gave an example of that, you know, when I mentioned the, the kind of, of God uh, that can do uh, in order to furnish us with the ground uh, of moral values, I hate the word, but okay, that's, that's indifferent. Eh? Okay, you can have the uh, rather uh, bloodless god of the uh, of the Enlightenment philosophers in order to do that. If you want to uh, reach, if you want to set your sights higher, then you'll have to shift to uh, a higher gear. And as far as persons are concerned, uh, well, uh, we have a, uh, well, it's for us sort of necessary to uh, give them a privilege uh, because we are persons. But this is not egoism. This is simple care for, well, our health. And well, I ended my my, um, no, it's not, not the very end of my presentation, but right to, towards the end, uh, by saying that we badly need <laughs> salvation. Yeah? Uh, we badly need to become sort of more personal than what we are, for we are maimed persons, uh, persons who have lost uh, a great deal of their freedom. Uh, people who have to be cured. We are all uh, <laughs> in the, the hospital ward that I was alluding to in my parable of sorts. And well, there is no personism or no personism with a derogatory uh, a tinge of meaning uh, as long as we consider that we have persons but persons who, uh, well, are uh, at the uh, health station. Uh, no, I'm groping the word, you know, we are in intensive care. That's what I was trying to, to convey. Okay. <laughs>